my name is MJ Petroni, and I'm a cyborg anthropologist, which is a fancy way of saying I paid money to study Star Trek. Um, and I got a great return on investment because I get to talk to folks like you. And what we do as cyborg anthropologists is look at the relationship between humans and technology. There's a lot of technology studies people, uh, you know, what's happening with code and advanced, um, you know, transistors and all of that. And there's a lot of anthropology people, uh, you know, what's going on with groups of people, how is our culture changing, how is marketing and branding shifting. And a lot of times uh, people want to talk to me about just one thing or the other, but it ends up being a conversation about both pieces. And most importantly, it becomes a conversation about how not just we're creating technology, but technology is recreating us. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about cyborgs and what we call the social network of things. Um, if that sounds buzzwordy or familiar, it's because it's related to that internet of things that everyone's talking about. We're going to talk about the difference between those things, and we'll also talk a little bit about what this means for businesses that you're supporting, your end clients, and for you as businesses, touch on some things about talent and lots of other stuff. Um, and there is no way we're going to be able to touch all of it. So the first thing I want to do is give you this URL, which is causeit.org. That's our company um, where we do innovation consulting, and we work with people all around the world to build their innovation teams. It's about half of our work. The other half of our work is this futurist stuff about what's coming 10, 20, 50 years out. And if you go to that page, what you're going to see is this great thing where you can ask me questions or call BS on something that I've said and say, that doesn't make any sense. I would love to hear from you. So this is probably the only talk you're going to hear where I'm going to say, please have your phones out, be texting, be emailing, whether it's to your coworkers to say, we got to get on this, or to me to say, I don't understand what you're saying. You need to slow down, because that's the thing I have to remember. All right, but let's talk about humans, right? What makes us meaningfully human? Uh, how do we understand this spark that makes us human? And we, you know, we invoke it all the time. To be human is to, right? And I is it that we use tools to extend our capacity? Well, maybe that's part of it, right? Um, is it that we live in these big and complex systems where we have to organize everything from electricity to sewage to internet services? You know, that's part of it. It's our ability to be collective, our, our power of language. Um, you know. But the other piece is how we take data and turn it into information. And the way that our industrial age has shifted and gone into and, and started the information age tells us a bit about how data came to be. And in, even a few years ago, code was still recognizable, and you could put it up on the wall. And the output you got was about as complex as the input that you had. It wasn't really exponential shifts in, in data turning into meaningful information or insight. <coughs> And so I was like, all right, cool, computers. I'm really into computers. I tinkered a lot as a kid, and I read Star Trek books and everything. But I was also an avid cyclist. I love bikes. And um, I was convinced I was going to ride my bike around the world, and I may still yet. I haven't gotten around to it. Um, and so I wrote my thesis on the relationship between human beings and their bicycle as an example of how a simple tool can radically change our perception of the world around us and have us be able to reach places we couldn't otherwise. And uh, our colleague from Griffin Hill is going to talk about this tomorrow, I imagine, because he just did this really exciting thing that I'm not going to do the spoiler for. And if we look inside our machines, they're a lot more complex than those couple of lines of codes. Uh, I think an interesting example is that we stopped having mechanics and we started having automotive technicians. You have to understand code and software to be able to work on a car now. But that's still somewhat comprehensible because it's doing things we already knew how to do. What's interesting as internet access and mobile access becomes pervasive is that we're starting to change the fundamental ways that we communicate or perceive the world as anyone, uh, well, I'll just ask, how many of you have two-year-olds or have seen a lot of two-year-olds recently, or real young ones? You've seen them with an iPod or some kind of multi-touch thing, and it's a little scary, like they know exactly what they're doing with it. Um, that's changing the way that we learn and interact with the world and the way that we educate our, our, our society, right? But one thing we have not figured out how to do very well yet, and maybe we won't ever be able to, is how to quantify human emotion. And what is it that's the piece of communication that makes us fundamentally human? And, you know, what happens is our bodies change and we have implants and these science fiction style realities of, you know, um, implanting that flash drive that was just talked about and instantly getting all the knowledge. Or, you know, your pacemaker, you know, if you have one of those, that's, that's a cyborg kind of thing. You have this piece of technology inside of you that you are now interdependent with. And 
it gets really interesting when we start to talk about these science fiction movie style things where people upload their brains to the cloud, right? Um, it's often called the singularity, um, or as we sometimes call it in Silicon Valley, it's the geek rapture. That's where all the programmers just upload themselves, right? Um, might be kind of cool, but also, you know, I don't know that we're necessarily ready for that and that it's not right for everyone. And it sounded very far-fetched, but it's getting more real than it used to be. So the fundamental point of today's talk is that machines have relationships too. Machines have reasons to connect with each other. They have purposes that they want to share with each other. And right now, that's all coded by human beings. It's usually not you know, machines being self-determining or something. But we need to stop thinking about the, um, the social networks as just being for humans. We need to talk about a social network for things. And we need to understand what that might mean for the businesses that we're interacting with and, and the code that we're developing and the technologies we're leveraging. So we're going to start with this industrial age thing, right, where everything was about making things. And our systems for business, our leadership styles, everything was based in that. And right now, this internet of things is starting to come. And it's, it's before the information age. It's where we're taking all of these things and we're connecting them to the web so we can capture more data from them. As we go along, though, we're starting to be more in the peak of the information age. We're nowhere near it, actually, because it's climbing exponentially. We have a lot of data, but we don't have all that much meaningful information from it yet. The big data analytics are, is actually kind of still in its infancy, right? And in that age, the social network of things might arise where devices can actually negotiate outcomes with each other. And we'll talk about this with driverless cars in a minute. And they can mitigate impacts, also with the driverless example. The connected home and all these other things are about allowing humans to say to a machine, please do this thing for me that I would otherwise have to do manually. And please negotiate with all the other players in that equation to make it work. Then we start talking about this deep cyborg age, right? Which is when the line between the technology and the human gets very blurry. And that we started going into that, that science fiction piece around the post-human age. And post-human is kind of shorthand for that geek rapture that I mentioned. <laughs> so as we talk about the industrial age and the internet of things, that purple bar kind of represents maybe some of you in this room who have a couple connected home devices or your car talks to the internet. It's, you haven't even reached the beginning of the internet of things for the most part because most of the people around you aren't also using those pieces. And then we talk about the cutting edge of the industry, Nest and um, you know, these driverless cars and you know, Google's experiments with glasses that people wear that have the internet all the time, so you know, new advertising. Um, and that's the very cutting edge of the industry. And so we're going to talk about this shift from the industrial age through here, and we're going to talk about some specific cultural shifts that are happening right now that drive this and how that's changing the nature of innovation. And then I'll touch on these other places that I just mentioned, and we'll dive into it. So let's talk about some of these shifts. My colleague Mark Bonchek wrote about a lot of these pieces, and it's a very succinct way of describing some of what's going on right now. For one, organizations are moving from hierarchies to networks. Right? You could say that Talaris and its teams and all of you as partners are part of a network of leadership because you're informing what the leadership direction of the company is, and you're at the edges doing the real work of the company with the end customers and bringing that information back. Companies like Google do things like have duplicate teams. They might have the same team in New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Tokyo and you know, wherever else. And they do that because the power of the network is such that they want people to be able to innovate where the innovation is needed, not just where it can be imagined by a particular executive in the home branch. So hierarchies are layering on this network leadership approach, which I'm sure you'll hear more about tomorrow from some of our other speakers. Strategy, and this is a really big one, and it's very relevant to your industry. Strategy is moving from products, the shiny iPhone or the particular service you can subscribe to, to platforms. And not just any platform, it's a certain kind of platform, a multi-sided platform. How many of you have heard of a multi-sided platform? Um, it's a kind of a business buzzword thing that's going on right now. It's OK if you haven't. And, um, Multi-sided platforms, for the most part, haven't shown up in the business world all that much, but there's one huge example that is on every table here, and that's the App Store that is where you're buying applications for your mobile device. 
A multi-sided platform is where a big company or a consortium comes together to do the heavy lifting of innovation in some parts, and then they partner with people at the edges of the network that have the actual use cases to develop a specific app or whatever else. Now, that could be a one-on-one -on -one, you know, partnership, but actually when you do it at scale, a multi-sided platform is something that allows other parties, app developers, accessory makers, handsets, you know, all of those folks, to create value on top of a core platform like Google's Android or Apple's iOS. Imagine what might happen if there were truly a multi-sided platform in telecom or insurance or automotive. What if there is a platform for mobility that you purchase from a major automaker, not the car, and you could plug in the stereo you like and you plugged in the apps that you wanted and all those pieces connect? That's starting to happen, and it's very difficult to compete with once it gets a toehold in a market. So you want to be participating in the creation of those. Individuals, how many of you here self-identify as a consumer? It's kind of gross, right? Like the only consuming I want you to do is like this great food. I don't actually want you to relate to yourself as a consumer, as an identity. It's kind of just like, ugh. You know, um, it's schmaltzy. I was just in Germany and I, I learned that schmaltz is actually like, it's like greasy, buttery pork fat. It's gross, okay? Um, so consumers is not the word that we want to use here. Co-creators, the people that are out there that are creating value with you as a company. Great example of this is YouTube. You don't just consume video, you can comment on it, you can share it, you can remix it, you can upload your own video. All of these different, you can annotate it. And all of those different pieces are about co-creating value, and that's why YouTube was able to completely change the market, and that's why Google bought them, okay? Because they were about co-creating value. When you're working with your end customers, it's not this that they're consuming a service. They have an outcome in mind, and you are uh, potentially able to help them create something there that they couldn't do on their own and that you can't do on your own. But there are other examples to look at in the consumer space right, the individual space as well that are starting to creep into the business space. And then brands are moving from pushing content at people, yelling at them, say, look, look, look at my shiny advertisement, look at my billboard, to pulling people in. And, and what I mean by that is not a trick. It's by continuously creating value. It's by touching that connection over and over and over and over and over again. So the interesting example here is Nike. Um, Nike doesn't just make apparel anymore. They don't just make shoes. They host an entire experience around fitness. They have created a, their own platform where people can come in and with their friends and have fitness challenges. They can track what they're doing. They can set goals and share them. They can learn about fitness. All of these different things. Nike's a software company now, not just an apparel company. They're both. And what it does is that it says that people are getting value out of their relationship with that brand over and over and over and over again. Not just when they buy the shoes or when the shoes break and they're pissed off about it and they want to go take them back, okay? So that shift from pushing some of the best design, loudest advertisements out there to pulling people in by continuously creating value is what my colleague Mark, who I mentioned before, he calls it ORBIT, it's an acronym ongoing relationship beyond individual transactions. You might know something about that. You're called partners for a reason, right? And that piece around how do you create value over and over, even when there's not an obvious transaction available, is the, the meat of how to actually have a relationship that is very, very strong and can actually defend against encroaching competition from the big box versions of people selling services but not really creating value. And on this note, Mark says this great thing. If you want to build loyalty, spend less time telling people about you and more time telling them about themselves. What information do you have about your customers and your clients that you can share with them that gets them insight into their businesses, right? Not how do you use analytics to be the, the richest partner out there. It's how do you create the most value and the rich part comes from that by extension. So in quick piece here, organizations moving from hierarchies to networks, strategy moving from product to platforms. Individuals are moving from consumers bleh, to co-creators, and brands are moving from push to pull. So that kind of covers it, right? Which is unifying theory of the world. Well, not quite, obviously. And uh, there's one big shift that's happening that's very relevant here, which is around IT. The relationship to technology is moving from IT as a utility within companies to 
informatics as a strategic capability. Okay, you can bet that Nike has people throughout its organization that understand how data works and how understand how apps work and understand how user experience works. They probably didn't start that way. They probably started with an IT team that said, why the heck are the brand people messing with creating apps and why do I have a database to manage, right? Major coffee company out there, they started their whole mobile app system that was their store finder powered by seven spreadsheets, okay? Huge coffee company all over the world. Now, that knowledge about how to use digital is throughout the organization. A lot of your clients are not here yet, but they need to start thinking about what talent they need in their organization to be able to compete with major digital businesses that are encroaching on their territory, and they also need to be able to take that ingenuity and entrepreneurship that they have as small businesses and be able to leverage the power of digital. And who are they gonna turn to to do that? Is it you? You have to be there to meet them with that knowledge and help them in that process. And you're all on this journey about learning that together. And that's part of the challenge of digital business for small and mid-sized businesses, is that they need the relationships of people who actually understand them. And it's hard to find them. Because every company is now a software company. My mom's a chiropractor, and for 32 years she had a chiropractic office, and she was an early adopter of electronic medical records and all this other stuff. And, you know, at a certain point, her business was dependent on software, and then she started creating her own custom software, not like coding, but in the form of spreadsheets and custom reports, right? And that was driving part of her value and efficiency as a business. That is meaning that she's now, in, in a small part, a software company. So a lot of your customers, even if they aren't obviously looking like software companies where they're creating apps, they're innovating in the software spaces that are on their desktops, their mobile devices, and they need partnership in doing that well. But let's talk about this Internet of Things piece that everyone is buzzing about and that I promised I'd tell you about, okay? Um, how many of you here are hearing from customers anything about Internet of Things? It's a bit of a feedback loop for me. Okay, just a smattering of hands throughout the room. So that's gonna change a bit. Right, because when I ask this conversation in different audiences, it's all over the map. Some haven't had any questions from their customers, some are getting tons. The Internet of Things is what happens, as I said, when you connect a lot of devices to the Internet. And um, it looks like, for example, all these different technologies that are very buzzy right now, Bluetooth low energy, near field communications, like the NFC thing on your mobile handset, it's all about big data and analytics, and it's about proximity, right? And when you walk near a particular store display, a beacon talks to your phone, and then it tells you an ad about that particular thing or new features about it or something like that, right? And all of these different pieces depend, of course, on cloud-based computing and a lot of these other technologies that are very relevant for, for you in this conference. But there's something that it doesn't do, and we're going to talk about the difference here. So systems and data in the Internet of Things, the early Internet of Things, are still kind of closed. Your device from one company doesn't talk to your device from another. And the purposes for those devices are kind of isolated. I have four different thermometer things in my house, one to measure the temperature inside the house, one to measure the temperature outside the house, one to entertain my kid, you know, whatever the different purposes are. And they, it's one sensor. Why is it four times in the same place, right? And so that purpose is not shared between devices yet. And design is constrained by what the developers can think of and the engineers can think of before the product is shipped. Great example being a car that can't have its software updated um, you know, after it's been shipped. That doesn't make any sense anymore, but that's, you know, that's the mindset that's still there around product-focused innovation where you set it and forget it. And information that you get from these devices is usually about something that already happened. It's past-based information. So let's talk about this a little bit. All of these different pieces convene in this place where we're talking about this human layer, right? There's a purpose this human being had. And then there's a machine layer, right? There's these different things that the machines have access to as data. And in between, in this messy, fleshy area between the merging of the human and machine, which might just look like someone looking at a report on their computer or their mobile device, there's this new kind of relationship between the human and the machine where they're starting to have feedback loops for each other and teach each other about stuff. But that's not necessarily always getting to that Internet of Things because those devices don't necessarily learn from the humans that bought them in the first place. Characteristics of the Internet of Things are using devices to be more efficient. We'll talk about this in a second. The machine learning in this age is uh, very driven by humans. What we learn from the data is because we know to ask for a specific report. 
and it's product thinking rather than platform, as I mentioned around these multi-sided platforms. It's on-demand information about the recent past, that which just occurred. Tell me how much energy I used, for example. And the data feedback loop is simple, and it's mostly for the human beings that bought the devices and connected them. Challenges here are privacy versus functionality. Network security is put in tension with innovation. So the IT team at a company says, no, you can't connect all these devices to our network. And you know, this new product team is like, yeah, but we want to play with all these sensors and robots and stuff. The networks are not necessarily smart enough to adapt, to turn up and down their capacity for these very bursty loads of traffic that come from Internet of Things. Because data that's from Internet of Things devices is not anything like a voice traffic. It doesn't follow the same consistent patterns. And you might get a burst of information as all these devices talk to each other and then nothing. That changes the nature of the network. And interoperability, as I mentioned, huge challenge here. The roles at this point, data engineers, product developers, industrial designers, you know, um, people who are supervising the manufacturing process around this and really influencing the quality, app developers, data architects, data monetizers. And if these sound like enterprise level roles, it's because they usually are. But increasingly, people are bringing in in-house web help and app development help, even in small or mid-sized businesses, as they start to realize they have a special value that's offered when they connect themselves to these apps and these users this way. By the way, all of these slides, because I see a few people taking pictures, which is a great compliment, thank you. Um, all of these slides are available on that URL I mentioned, and I'll show it at the end as well. And it's all written up as an article as well. So a great example of this is, you know, even before we talk about the connected home, we had this thing where we started connecting ourselves to maps. Google Maps or Apple Maps with traffic advisory, you know, to all those characteristics I talk about, it tells us information about what just happened, you know, about traffic. It helps us understand some basic things, and it's used to be more efficient than what we already knew how to do. It's not actually a big paradigm shift because everything that's being done by these things, which were huge innovations when they came out and took a considerable technical effort for sure, most of this was still designed in the model that um, we could conceive of, which is what can you do with AM traffic radio and a you know, good map book and some common sense? Now let's just do it faster and more consistently. That's what these devices and these apps were originally doing, what GPS was doing here. And it might connect a few of the dots to aggregate some traffic information, but it's not really predicting what's going to happen and it's not helping these different vehicles negotiate traffic with each other like, hey, you take the 405, I'll take the 5, and then we'll avoid this traffic if everyone splits up and plays fair. That's not actually happening. It's mostly just the, tr the same old, same old, but faster and digital. So let's jump ahead, right? I said 1.0, 1 1.5, 2.0. I'm going to jump ahead to 2.0, so the contrast is obvious. The social network of things here, this is where we're talking about really maybe less familiar tech terms, like robotic architecture, buildings that change shape as needed. Why does this room have to be built in just one size? Why can't the walls move? And not just the, the accordions, but the whole building, right? Negotiation of devices. So, hey, if you swerve left, I'll swerve right, then we won't have a car accident, right? cars that could actually negotiate that at the speed of the, the data connection, those don't exist yet. The technology and the mindset is available in our developers, but we don't have the legal or regulatory stuff in place, and we don't have the cultural okay for it yet. Mitigation, there's the same thing about avoiding a negative impact. Personal clouds, people's individual information and little data, the data around a particular person, not just the big data, is starting to be the biggest conversation around the social network of things. So I can go on and on about a lot of these, and we can talk afterwards about any of them in detail. But it starts to mean that there are paradigms that aren't fully understood by the people developing the software and devices now. All of these different criteria I talked about before, they're on the other end of the spectrum. Everything's interoperable. Purposes are shared between mul multiple devices and sensors. Design is highly responsive to the user's needs, and it changes over time. And information is predictive of the future, right? So a car will say, hey, I see that you're about to have an accident and you might want to do this thing about it or it might not even have time to tell you and it actually does it for you. And by the way, I negotiated with the other car to swerve and we managed to use this traffic camera that was on this accessible API that we could tap into to have me see this blind spot around the corner that was the accident waiting to happen that I didn't own, right? So that's a responsive you know, set of devices. It's a shared set of purposes. The traffic camera maybe wasn't originally designed for that, but it can still serve that if it's connected properly. But there's creepy things with that too, which I'm sure you can imagine. So the characteristics here are there is as much or more culture work than code. 
educating business owners and the people who work with all these devices, right, uh, legal and regulatory infrastructure and frameworks. The digital divide is enormous. People who get it and people who don't get it might be like the no's and the no-nots instead of the haves and the have-nots. And that divide is huge. If you've ever sat next to you know, your kid when they're looking for a job versus you looking for a job, you realize the way that they do that might look a little different. Machines begin to learn on their own at this point, and entirely new value is possible. Not just old versions of stuff turned digital, but entirely new value. Great example of this is way back in history, Gutenberg's press was originally used to print just more Bibles, which was the most common book. It was not sparking the publishing revolution overnight any more than digital was sparking huge paradigm shifts right away. Interoperability is super required here, and we have mature platforms emerging, enormous security issues at play, and the information that we're getting from these systems is predictive about the present. This is the thing that's about to happen, and we know it from connecting all these sensors and algorithms and our smarts. And automatic machine-to-machine -machine payments, which is actually a, a weird non sequitur in a way, but if you think about it, if these devices can go do things on their own and negotiate with each other, why is it that you need to drive your car to the gas station and put the gas in, or the electrical charger or whatever? Why is it that you need to, if your car can drive itself and go pick up a, a, you know, something from Best Buy for you, why is it that you would have to go with it to hand the card, right? The vehicles and these other devices can actually initiate machine-to-machine -machine payments, and that's a whole new opportunity as well. There are tensions here, though, big ones. Fairness and equality. Who gets access, right? Who makes the decisions? We'll talk about this with driverless cars in a second, with safety conflicts especially. Legacy system retirement. You know the old servers that are or are not in place and not functioning properly in these, in these companies. So in order for a company to opt into these newer models of doing business and connected devices, they're going to need to retire some old systems. And huge political and cultural backlash, like, hey, why does my refrigerator have a camera in it and who can actually see what's on that camera? And is that okay, right? Roles at this point are around artificial intelligence developers, liaisons with regulatory environment, cyborg anthropologists, which is not really a plug, it's so much as a catch-all for people who can talk both languages, the human business, you know, that piece, and the digital programmer techie stuff that can actually connect the dots. And machine teachers, people who are teaching these machines to be smarter and more effective. So let's talk about driverless cars here. See this guy, I'm standing in London and I'm watching this happen. This guy runs across traffic, doesn't have the light, and that car hits the brakes and then he jumps across. The other car doesn't even touch the brakes and everything, fortunately, was okay, right? But not a lot of information was actually passed between those two cars. There's a lot of judgment calls, but not a lot of information or data was actually passed between those two vehicles. In fact, just one bit, as in zero or one, and that's where the brake light's on. So that one little tiny piece of information was all the driver had time to do. But, you know, how many tons and tons and tons of bits of information could we pass back and forth and what could that mean? Well, the car in the front, if it were a driverless car, or even just augmented car, might have sensors around, you know, the pavement moisture, the wheel speed, the cameras in the front of its grill passing that information back to the system in the other car behind it. They can negotiate between each other like, hey, I'll slam on the brakes, but you have to do it too so we don't get a rear-end accident, okay? Okay, great, go. Way faster than any human being ever could because these cars aren't connected when they're human being driven. But that whole set of complexity takes a lot of cooperation between different companies, and it's not obvious how we would get there right away. We have the technology, and this is really important. All the science fiction stuff about driverless cars and you know, the jets and so on, we have that. It's all here. But we don't have the understanding or interoperability between these companies, and we don't have the cultural okay, and we don't have the legal framework in place. But that won't necessarily stop people, and we'll see that in just a minute. So let's talk about this in-between state. It might be more like what your customers are seeing at home and maybe they're bringing into their small, home, small business offices or mid-sized businesses offices, right? These are connected devices. How many of you have or know what a Nest uh, smart learning thermostat is? A couple of you, right? You might have seen it at Best Buy or wondered what it's about. So the smart learning thermostat says, I'm going to connect um, to the internet your thermostat at home and I'm going to help you learn a little bit about your usage patterns and do it smarter. And maybe we'll have the same company, Nest, will offer Nest Protect, which is a smoke detector. And we'll have those two talk so that you turn off the furnace if you detect smoke. Sounds smart? Great. Not a lot of devices here, 
and it's still reporting past base information. It's not doing a ton of predictive analytics, right? There's not a lot going on there, but it's still pretty cool. Well, not long after they launched the original product, they launched Works with Nest. Works with Nest connected a lot of dots. Now, your car could turn on the thermostat, so by the time you get home, the air conditioning has kicked in or the heater's on. Your jawbone up, you know, fitness tracker can tell the, the thermostat when you're starting to wake up, when you're falling out of deep REM sleep, and it turns on the thermostat. Your LAFX lights, um, they're going to be able to flash red if the smoke detector is going off. And Whirlpool might coordinate with the thermostats to not blow out your home electricity circuits, especially if you're running on solar. And I think this one was the best. Virgin America, the airline, um, announced they were going to install Nest thermostats at every single seat so you can bring your personal climate profile with you and not be all sweaty because you ran to catch the flight. That's kind of cool, right? I thought it was really cool, and I told all these people about it. I was on these audiences and standing on these stages until I realized that the press release was on April 1st. <laughs> Eek. Um, but it's, I think it's still cool, and we should do it anyway. So, no. so the beginning of Social Network of Things is about proximity sensing and algorithms where machines are learning from each other and regulation is starting to kick in. We're starting to deal with standards and APIs and merging the different interfaces between devices, right? Everything's converging around the mobile phone or some kind of hub. You're starting to see interoperability. Now, what does this mean for your smart customers, right? They might have a retail environment where they're doing automatic inventory with 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 different sensors in even a small store, right? How do you coordinate all of that? How do you help them do that? You know, you might have um, a medical office that knows if the patient's ready to go from one room to the next because of a sensor that's attached to the clipboard they have that tells them where that patient is in the office, right? My mom spent a lot of time trying to figure out whether there's a patient in the treatment room or not, you know? So starting to connect these dots here, and even for small businesses, some cool opportunities and mid-sized businesses are dealing with major inventory tracking or they're dealing with fleet tracking. Where are my cars and trucks and are they maintained properly? Are my employees taking them off for joy rides, right? So at this point, all of those criteria talked about are right in the middle. They're in transition, kind of messy time, lots of duplicate systems, lots of startups trying to do new things. The data makes entirely new value possible at this point, not just improving old products and services. There was not an old product that turned on your thermostat when you were driving home. Now there is an offering that's a joint offering between the car maker and Nest that allows that to happen. Evolving platforms start to connect the dots. Apple's HomeKit, Google's HomeKit, or they have a different term for it, but Google's um, IoT or Internet of Things specific operating system. And if you're feeling like completely overwhelmed by all of these different terms and technologies, trust me, I get it. I do this full time, and I'm always learning stuff that I should have known already about this stuff. Imagine how your customers feel. They never get to touch this tech stuff for the most part, and they still are needing to do some of it. Maybe it's a requirement by some of the companies they're working with now. Machines are learning automatically when directed. Hey, tell me what's happening with my energy usage, for example. And you're getting just-in-time information about the present. The feedback loops are starting to be not just for humans, but those other devices so they can all coordinate with each other. Challenges at this point start to be about privacy. So who has my data? Who knows what's going on in my house or my business? Is that okay? Very unclear business models. How do you charge for this? Who makes money from this? Does it make sense to make a bajillion connected tea kettles? Probably not. Right, legacy system integration, as I mentioned, is still very much the thing here, and the huge lack of standards in this messy in-between point. The roles at this point are around standards developers and in, in the companies that are developing these products, um, ethics and privacy teams, public relations gurus. I was just speaking at the Quest Forum. Um, any of you know what Quest Forum is? A couple of you. It's a telecom-related event, uh, or I mean, group, um, and they focus specifically on standards for quality for telecom. Because if you have those connected cars negotiating between each other, you don't want a network outage at the time you're trying to avoid hitting someone. Okay, that doesn't work real well. Now, there's things they're developing around that that are about direct machine-to-machine -machine network communication. That's a whole other area of opportunity for you know people who are really adding value when they're selling these services. API community managers, people who are kind of connecting the dots from all the different companies that are using an API, right? So I, I heard someone mention uh, earlier today that AT&T is opening up APIs around some of its telecom services. You can bet that they have someone who's tracking, who has access to that API and checking in with them. Is this working for you? Is this w all right? Are you using this data appropriately, right? Another great example of this, um, any of you Wazers, you know what Waze is? 
So Waze is pretty cool. It's what you happens when you take a mapping system like Google or Apple Maps and you really connect the dots between these different cars and you say, hey, let's coordinate the information between all these different vehicles so that we avoid accidents. We notify each other of accidents that are happening and we have a social network that connects those dots. And it was such an important innovation because it helped people avoid so much traffic that Google bought it for $1.4 billion dollars which is quite a lot for a company that wasn't around that long and being bought by a company that already had a huge mapping system. But the increased value of being able to connect the dots and have people be able to coordinate their cars to avoid traffic with no extra effort. Speaking of things that were moving quickly, um, when I first started giving this talk, uh, March 2014, California was pushing to finish driverless car regulations. Now, I don't know about you, but the DMV is not usually where I go if I want something done really quickly with the utmost respect to them. They try really hard, but not a lot of resources to go quickly. They said by the, you know, driverless cars could be commercially available by decade's end, and, you know, we need draft language resolutions. We need something in place by the end of the year, okay? They had something in place two months later. They were early. That doesn't happen a whole lot. So they green-lighted testing of driverless cars. Well, this is driven by the automakers, right? Well, not exactly. It's the automakers, but it's also these tech startups who are disrupting existing industries and saying, we need to get this stuff in motion and we want to respect the regulatory space, but we're not waiting for you either. And to know how much they're not waiting, those cool Teslas that people keep talking about, interesting thing, this summer, over the air, they announced a software update to enable driverless cars. There are already driverless cars. Not the decade's end, now. That's how quickly things are changing. So on major roads and highways in California and in other places I imagine as well, um, the Tesla Model S with no special upgrades, it already had all the capabilities and sensors, they just repurposed them and connected the dots and did all the things they needed to do with that. Over the air, got an update. Oh cool, your car you know, is version 3.0, now runs driverless car. So that's the pace at which things are changing with this social network of things, and that's why we must start to do this work to educate people about what the standards need to be and the privacy and ethics implications. Now, if we get further along, and I'm not going to spend as much time in all of this, this deep cyborg age is where kind of dorky language here on Star Trek, right? It's when you aren't able to you know, separate the line between human and machine. Total science fiction stuff, right? But we have pacemakers. Those are inside, and you can't separate it once it's in there. Um, you know, there's a very famous vice president recently who disabled the radio connection on his pacemaker because he didn't want it, um, you know, to be hacked remotely. Well, that sounds kind of smart, actually, now that you think about it, because I know how data security works, and I know how long it takes to get that stuff actually into devices, and the security that's in that pacemaker is probably pretty old. So... That's an issue that we're already starting to deal with, but just little tiny bits. But as the technology advances, we're 3D printing organs, we're having the ability to, and this is a cool one, slash scary one, um, we can now stimulate the optic nerve and have a 50 by 50 pixel image of our own choosing actually show up in someone's brain, which is a huge breakthrough for people with vision problems, right? But also, what happens if that optic nerve implant gets hacked by someone who wants to put, you know, clickbait and spamware, uh, and spam in front of your eyes all the time? Right, we're not, we're not ready for that yet either. <laughs> Heads up display on, you know, where to find the best deal on a hotel in Las Vegas, right? Um, so the deep cyborg age, as we talk about this, big questions about extended lifespan as we have life-altering technologies to be able to improve people's ability to deal with disease and major organ failures, right? Um, wetware is a big issue around neural implants, uh, the ability to design a human-machine interaction that's not theoretical, but actually quite wired in, right? And big questions about classware, warfare actually, because this stuff's going to be expensive, especially at first, and some people will have these highly augmented lives and bodies that are very connected, and there'll be a lot of people who don't have access to that, and as these people are in some ways, potentially more capable in the workplace or whatever else, what is that going to mean for who gets access to what and what education looks like if education is about downloading a repository of information to your body? So lots of ethics questions here, and nanotechnology is another big one. But some other stuff here, you know, we see all these connected devices. The short version on this is the idea of any one cloud or any one server to protect or to coordinate, it's going to get very fuzzy. It's going to be more like the fog. It's, uh, some companies talk about this now with the fog than the cloud, 
right? Pervasive data everywhere and a whole bunch of different ways to access it and make meaningful information from it. Now, electromagnetic pulse. Any of you know what that is? EMP? Cool, it was in the second Matrix movie. It's the thing that they used to shoot those crazy squid robots and kill them because it's a huge pulse of energy that can disrupt integrated circuits and other kinds of you know, electronics. And you know, uh, here's a risk. You can actually point an EMP gun at a server farm and take it down. And it can be in a van outside, no one ever opens the door, and it's done. Now that's scary enough, and there's things that people are doing to shield themselves against EMP attacks, and most people don't know about this stuff. But think about it if you have embedded devices, that optic nerve, right? Someone could shoot a vision killing gun at you and it fries that optic nerve implant. That's not really cool. <laughs> We're not ready for that either. So there's a lot of these ethical questions, but also some practical ones around security that we need to deal with. Another one is around this nanotech piece. So it's becoming less fiction and more science that we could have these little devices in our bloodstream. We're already looking at medicines that pierce the cell barriers, nanomedicines. This is already happening. It's actually, you can get it in your sunscreen. You can get it in a coating on your genes. We don't really have great standards and ethics about this in place yet. And that's a little you know, thing that to think about. But at the same time, very targeted delivery of medication is available now. But if you want to think about this, so let's say we have the ability to develop these very small robots that they are able to move around and, um, you know, within our bodies or at least in our other devices and you know, cleaning stuff up that's broken in there. You, know, you have to make sure those devices are coordinated, that they're secure, and that they're consensual, right? that it's consensual to have that in our bodies. So that's another big area that we're, is we're dealing with the line between human and machine not being so separable that you want to be a little cautious about. The characteristics in this age are that you can't separate the human from the tech. And you know, remember that this conversation, if I were standing on a stage 10 years ago, this would be the very far out conversation around driverless cars. So we might see this very quickly, we might not. There's a lot of different variables at play here. But in this age, skin is no longer necessarily the boundary between us and them around technology, right? And machine intelligence might actually be trusted somewhat more than humans. If you think about a car that can send a billion different pieces of information to another car to help the two of them coordinate and avoid an accident, after a while, Elon Musk talks about this, the, the Tesla guy, you know, it, we're gonna potentially have a conversation about is it okay to have these highly risky human-driven vehicles on the road anymore? And we laugh now, but you know, it, we already do that sometimes with automated trains and other, other devices, right? So certain kinds of machine intelligence are entrusted more sometimes than human beings in this age, except perhaps for regarding emotion. And pervasive robotics will have changed the fundamental nature of work. And the, even the sentient AI, an AI that is self-aware that says, I am, could potentially emerge with the kind of programming and the kind of processors that are emerging, which is a huge existential and spiritual question for people and a major potential risk. Stephen Hawking and lots of other leaders in thought and technology are saying, we're not so sure this is a good idea. In fact, it may be the death knell for the human race, which may be a little dramatic, but something to pay attention to again. Tensions at this point are about what is natural. How much do we modify biology before we've gone too far? How far is too far to evolve? And how do we put on the brakes? And can we even, right? And the roles at this point are wetware designers and technicians. You know, your kid goes to Claire's right now and gets an ear piercing. It might be that in 10 years she goes and gets a, you know, optic nerve implant that has the, the access to the coolest social network in it, right? Empathy experts, people who understand what is going on for all these different parts of society and are helping bridge those conversations, but are also helping software developers who might be very buried in a particular way of living and doing code to understand and provide more of a human element to the software and technology that's being developed. Sentience monitors around, do we want that sentient AI, that self-aware AI? And coaches for artificial intelligences to make sure that they're doing things that are a little more in line with the way we'd like to have things go. And then finally, and I'm gonna go very quickly through this because uh, it's, you know, uh, it's very far-fetched in some ways, which is this post-human state where we have fundamental paradigm shifts about what it is to be human. If you can up upload your consciousness or your memories to the, to the cloud or whatever we call it by then, um, what makes you human? Is it the thoughts and collections? Is it the sense of being embodied? Right, so we will have potentially a fundamental conversation in these ages of this cyborg and then even post-human state around maybe creating a new species and, and do we really want to play God that way? 
or you know, is it too late at that point to change our minds? So I want to instill a cautious optimism about the things like those nanomedicines that can do great work, but I also want us to have a cautious optimism around things around artificial intelligence and the rest of it. And so, you know, with that, I'd like to, uh, I'm going to skip ahead on this a little bit here because it's a little bit too much detail for the moment. Sorry, I ran low on time here. But there's more about this in the article. And I'd like to just leave us with this question about, for each of us, what is our own fundamental sense of being human? And if we're not educating ourselves about these conversations around everything from digital business to advanced artificial intelligence and helping our customers and our families and our friends navigate it, who's going to do it for us? Right? So it is incumbent upon us as citizens in a more digital age to actually become empowered and aware of the kinds of decisions and the kinds of questions we need to be looking at right now. So thank you. <laughs>